because that's the type of numbers that we used in our everyday lives back when we were hunting animals on the plain and or herding cattle into pens, okay, or counting pumpkins at the patch, right? Those were the numbers that we first encountered. And so it might come as a surprise to most people that this number didn't come into existence until thousands of years into mankind's development. It was a Indian mathematician, Hindu mathematician named Brahmagupta that first introduced and formalized this concept of nothingness that he called the number zero. And he's the first to prove that zero plus any number, say A, is itself A. And zero times any number A is zero. But that notion of zeroness didn't exist until Brahmagupta. The Babylonians really struggled with this because when they wanted to draw a number, by the way, Babylonians were base 60 mathematics, were base 10, right? So we go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then if we have to go, we get put 1 over here and 0. That's base 10 system. They're base 60. But just let's stick to our base 10 to understand it better. We understand that as 101, right? But if we had no concept of the 0, this number could just appear in writing as 1-1. One, one. That'd be pretty confusing, right? I mean, the Babylonians thousands of years ago realized that pretty quickly. So they did just basically have a blank space, but they had no concept of zero. So one comes first, zero comes second. Okay? And actually, probably, well, well before zero was the concept, but not the notation of So this was a well-known constant to the Greeks and the mathematicians beyond. Yeah, it's the, it's the ratio of a circle circumference to diameter. It doesn't matter if the circle is the size of a dime or the size of the galaxy. We get this constant, pi. And studying interest in the 1600s, you got uh, E comes along? Yeah, but I think studying cubics in the 1500s with, uh, was his name, Federico Cardano, was, or maybe it's Tartaglia. Tartaglia is the one who really developed the method for solving the general cubic. But out of that spilled these crazy solutions where you'd get negatives under the square root sign, and they'd be like, that's completely imaginary, that can't happen. So he would just discard and he'd ignore those crazy imaginary solutions and just produce the one real solution to the cubic which is guaranteed for a cubic. So the reason they were imaginary numbers is because they obviously no mathematician worth his salt would ever dabble in these crazy you know, solutions to the cubic. And then about 200, almost 300 years later, you know, with the advent of engineering and physics, and they realized, oh, these have a useful property, so mathematicians caught on to them. They realize it's the closure of the real numbers, or at least the, uh, the extension of the real numbers, the field extension. So you get the complex numbers, right? And so they actually have a very prominent foot place in mathematics today. Finally, in the study of compound interest, right, the study of compound interest leads to this expression. And, and then what happens, basically x is the number of comp compounding periods, what happens? Well, it turns out that this can be approximated as 2.718281828 dot dot dot, and it looks at this point like it repeats as if it's rational. Okay. So that was the question. Actually, it does not repeat. And a guy by the name of Leonard Euler, who was a Swiss mathematician, was the first to prove that E is irrational. And in fact, he's the first to give it the name E which many people think is because of his last name, but actually, in 18th century mathematics, the vowels were very commonly used for unknowns like we use X, Y, Z today. And so earlier in the paper, he had already defined what A was, so he just went to the next unknown letter. He said, let E be this number, and he proved that E's irrational. Okay, so beginning of time, thousands of years later, Greek mathematicians, probably the Babylonians, maybe. Thousands of years later, Brahmagupta. 
thousand years later, I, and maybe a hundred years later, D. So these numbers are separated by millennium, literally. So this guy, Euler, also found a nice little relationship. He says, if we expand the exponential function using the Taylor series, okay, not named for Chad Taylor, by the way, Brooke Taylor, English mathematician. And we expand the cosine series. And we expand the sine series. So Euler's looking at this and saying to himself, well, I really should be able to put in anything I want for my variable, right? This expansion should work for any variable. Which actually requires a little more careful proof with the complex numbers, but he just did stuff a lot. He actually did stuff that led to crazy results. Like he plugged like he plugged two into the geometric expansion. Uh, so the geometric is one plus r plus r squared plus R cubed plus dot 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 plus R and plus dot dot dot. And uh, it's convergent of R is. It's convergent of R is between one. the magnitudes between negative 1 and 1, right? So if you plug like 2 into this, you get some crazy identity that, you know, this is the type of crap you see on the internet when they're like, oh, look, you can get the thing to convert. Like the sum of the natural numbers converges to 1 12th or negative 1 12th. But anyway, that's obviously crazy. But he did this, okay. and when he did this, okay. and he plugs in, well, I'll do this for a few terms, and then we'll see the pattern. What's I squared? What's I to the cubed? Positive. Negative I. Negative I. What's I to the fourth? One. What's I to the fifth? I. So Euler looks at this and he says, isn't this interesting? If you allow me just to rearrange the terms in any way I want, okay, and I look at just the, I'll say even power terms, so the zeroth power, the second, the fourth, etc. That's just the series for cosine. Okay. And then if you look at all of the odd powers, That's just the expansion for sine, but multiplied by a factor of i. Okay. So, in trigonometry, or at least in our pre-calculus, you talk about the trigonometric form, or polar form of a complex number. Right? This could be called the Euler form of a complex number. And if we say pick a convenient value, let's pick, we could pick any angle that we wanted for x. Well, let's suppose I pick x to be pi. What is the cosine of pi? What is the sine of pi? Zero. 
This is known as Euler's identity, and it should make you freak out. Because five numbers that span the millennia of civilization are all tied together by one fundamental identity. Isn't that cool? Spooky at a distance. Spooky action at a distance. <laughs>